Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Dear Umer. It is Friday, October 8th, and we're reading an article published four days ago on October 4th entitled How We Need to Fix the World, with how in parentheses, how we need to fix the world. If we don't change the path we're on, the future is more collapsed, just faster and harder. All right, well, gentlemen, feel free to jump in as we uh, explore this awesome article. And instead of the normal red background, I'm just gonna put the Golden Gate Bridge, which I'm from the San Francisco Bay Area. Remember that Grateful Dead double album with San Francisco Bay and New York, anyway. Um, so reading on, perhaps like me, you think things aren't going so well in the world today. 1930s style authoritarianism, extremism, and stagnation rock the world like a hurricane once again. The question then is this, what kind of world do we want? In this essay, I'm going to offer three futures. They'll contrast the tension between hierarchy and progress. You see, the question you, in ages like this one is- Jamin? Yes, yes. You were not gonna do the red background while you're reading? Um, I'm doing the Golden Gate Bridge as the red background. Oh, I'm, okay. I'm signed in as a different, anyway, it's, it's complicated, gotcha. but, but yeah. But, but gotcha. thanks for asking, thanks for asking. Um, so, um, you see the question in ages like this one is whether hierarchies, which make things comfortable for those above the waterline, even during decline and collapse, can make us more capable of change, growth, and maturity somehow too. So I will write it from a curious perspective too, that we each decide in some way what kind of future we are to create. The first kind of future, so three kinds of futures he's gonna lay out. The first kind of future is more of the present. Stagnation gives rise to extremism, which fractures societies, gives rise to demagogues, fuels isolationism, and reopens old wounds of race, class, creed, and tribe. This is more or less the future that many of us subscribe to. In this kind of future, the rebirth of old hierarchies. I am above you. You are below me. I am of pure blood. You are not, and so on, emerges as people seek shelter from the storm seeking superiority by grouping together and pulling others down, which inevitably suffocates and destroys human possibility instead of liberating it. So even if we're on top of hierarchies, what do we lose in this future? Well, we lose progress itself. Progress stalls because societies do not invest in things that matter anymore. Instead, instead, they build walls, militaries, secret police forces, surveil their own citizens, and so on. And if you think I overstate the case, please take a hard look at America. So even if we are on top, what we lose is a higher quality of life. In this future, there are no great breakthroughs for some time to come. No cancer cures, no undiscovered frontiers, no great innovations. So even if we are at the top of hierarchies, we should not want this kind of future because decline of this kind will affect us too. Better to be in the middle of prospering, prospering hierarchies than riding precariously atop collapsing ones. Isn't that deep? I thought that was pretty deep. <clears throat> the second kind of future. Any questions or comments about that first one? This coincides with the release of uh, 
a list I saw of 36 billionaires that live in Florida alone. In Michigan, there happens to be five billionaires that live in Michigan, but Florida, 36. Thank you. Yeah. The hierarchy. Yeah. The second kind of future is one in which hierarchy comes undone, but takes progress with it too. That future is a bleak one. Institutions and norms blow apart all the kinds of social order from the rule of law to rights to careers implode. Hierarchies of these kinds shelter and protect us too. Societies turn into something more like jungles where only the strong survive. And while you might think that it is that it, that is hierarchy, the truth is that such a system is better called predatory because a legitimate hierarchy depends on consent to authority. But in this kind of future, no one consents. They are simply eaten alive regardless. So in this future, whomever is the most ruthless, cunning, remorseless, and cruel wins. Should we want to be on top of predatory systems? Perhaps if we have no choice, but it's still better to be part of systems in which losing doesn't mean foregoing one's life and winning doesn't have to mean preying on people because even if you win in such a system, it cannot really make any kind of progress. It can only ever go backwards. Which society is an example of that kind of future? America is. Their old hierarchies are beginning to implode, but society cannot agree on new ones. Without consent, the result is an institutional vacuum. People will not agree to be governed by one another. But in that kind of stalemate, little is possible. Democracy, justice, freedom, law, investment, norms. None of these can work if people cannot agree on the basics of self-governance. If they mistrust and despise each other as much as Americans do today. The result is that a new class of super predators has begun to rule in an institutional void because there is no mechanism or force to restrain them. The only rule is how hard one can bite. And because everyone is fractured, because no one can agree to be governed by anyone else, they are easily picked off. There is nothing that modern Americans don't suffer from mass school shooting to dying for lack of basic medicine. In this way, the implosion of American institutions into predatory systems has also turned progress into regress. Quite obviously, we should not want this kind of future, one without hierarchy entirely, in which no one consents to being governed by any, anyone else either. Because even if we manage to be among the strong who survive the ensu ensuing battle for life, what we are not doing is making progress. We are just fighting to exist in places which that bitter battle forever takes backwards as it is doing to America, while billionaires get richer and the poor get poorer. Wow. So from hierarchy to basically anarchy, predatory anarchy with predatory institutions. The third kind of future is a more positive one. It is one where hierarchy and progress come to work together once again, where we rediscover or maybe reinvent forms of human organization in which people can grow again. In that future, people regain their lost faith in, in institutions and systems. Hierarchies nurture and protect them, but progress liberates and frees them too. Ah, but can we have both of those things? Is that asking too much? Imagine that we finally get serious about reinventing corporations. 
we limit their reach, prevent them from dodging responsibility the way they do now. How would we do that? We create chief possibility officers and heads of meaning and purpose. <laughs> we create whole new roles like human well-being designer and eudaimonia architect. Overblown to be sure, but you get the idea. Here, hierarchy and progress begin to work together. Is doing that much really science fiction beyond us? Let's do another example. Imagine that we replace GDP with a national measure of well being. Now we have a new kind of hierarchy in society. It isn't those who contribute the most profit who are at the top, but those who contribute the most well being, eudaimonia, human growth. <laughs> Perhaps that hierarchy is crystallized through new norms, values, expectations. People admire and respect those institutions who improve their lives most and punish those who don't. Again, hierarchy and progress work hand in hand, each gently reinforcing the other. I think the kind of future we should want combines these two things. Progress so that human life continues to improve and grow, not stall and flame out. A little bit of consensual hierarchy because otherwise people feel lost, unsafe, unsure, and look for it in all the wrong places, like the arms of bellowing strongmen. But that is a very unlikely and special cocktail in history. It isn't often that we have ages in which progress and hierarchy find reinforcing forms. It happened in the post-war age, but not before it. It happened briefly, oh, here's Sarah coming in. Hey, Sarah, sister, welcome back. We are recording. We're doing a Dear Umer. We can pause any time, just say the word. Um, we're most of the way through the article, so... Um, but we'll go with the flow and then we'll read the comments, etc. It isn't often that we have ages in which progress and hierarchy find reinforcing forms. It happened in the post-war age, but not before it. It happened briefly during the Enlightenment, but not for millennia past. It happened during the Renaissance and then slowly faded away. These two forces naturally oppose one another, like fire and ice, hierarchy and progress. <clears throat> and it seems to me one of the great secrets history tries to teach us is that when we find ways to make them work together, then and only then human possibility opens to its fullest horizons. What kind of future do we want? One with lots of burdensome, bitter, and polarizing hierarchy? Groups vying to pull each other down, which flatlines progress? or one where consensual hierarchy has collapsed into predation. No one can agree to govern or be governed, so monsters rule, which leads to supercharged regress, or one in which improbably hierarchy and progress have learned improbably to walk hand in hand. That choice, I think, is the one that will define these times, Umer. So that's the article. Then there's a number of comments, which we love to read. I have some immediate thoughts, um, but I'm going to pass the talking feather. Um, so feel free to jump in with comments or questions. And uh, well, maybe now that I've got the feather, I'll just go ahead and well, oh, James, I saw that you unmuted. Go for it, James. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. No, I, I'm just saying like that. It feels to me that we're already on, you know, in that uh, lifestyle living already in fear. To, you know, the first one that he mentioned, the hierarchical uh, society. When we are in a hierarchical hierarchical society, anyway, like you know what I'm saying. Because even though we live under the illusion of uh, democracy, 
you know, does nobody really work in our favour. Look at the example there, just came out recently, just in the last two days of, you know, 390 world leaders, all of them with uh, offshore accounts and the billions all over the world. You know what I'm saying? So there's, 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 we're in a hierarchical society as it is. But we're cl quickly going into phase two, that second uh, choice, which is the nobody will listen to anybody and nobody will, you know, be any any society or, or uh, rule in the end of the day and it's just a madhouse and a mad max situation we, we we possibly are that's what we're going down into so we have to get to the stage where we recognize that in order that we leapfrog it into the the third one like, into the third uh, society that we need and that's what we're working here on in the block party and the collective intelligence and everything else is to try and get to that form of or that type of a society where we can work um hierarchically as well uh, you know on a on a scaled uh, version of it but collectively yeah and the which and the which facilitates progress go ahead james sorry no you're you that's it that's it exactly passing the fed up yeah beautiful beautiful yeah hierarchy and progress together and all that inspired me to to think something up which I'll, i'd love to share but i'll wait till others have had a a, a a time at the feather so passing the feather and no no pressure to talk i'm just just yielding the opportunity in case anyone has any kind of business. yeah and James, your mic is unmuted. And Marco, Marco, go for it. Yeah, I, I think those, you know, uh, any any one of the three options, even the third one that seemed to be uh, the better one, um, I think. There's something inherently wrong with every attempt we've had at any at hierarchies, uh, because it seems it's, it, it, when when you're at at or near the top, greed just seems to be overcome and and spoils it every time. I I don't know. Nothing I've seen in the last two years. Mm -hmm shows that the majority of people are um, evolved enough to make a fair hierarchy and make it work. <clears throat> I think we're, we're kind of still doomed to a few more years of, of greed and, and greed for money and power are are going to keep spoiling things. Uh, so it's going to, as as like the general rule, and I think it's going to take uh, an awful lot of work from from whatever group we can build to fight that fight that. Uh, that greed and you know make things as fair as possible for everyone uh, that's kind of my rambling thought there uh, and I'm complete past the feather awesome thanks Marco we got Jamin in the queue followed by Michael all right Jamin says um, you know, uh, here's one scenario that I find not just optimal, but also the most likely. And that is one where there is both hierarchy and progress. And the hierarchy is a hierarchy of ideas, of logic, of stories, of strategies, may the best bubble to the top. And I think in a properly architected and built network of conversations like we keep talking about right hundreds thousands of conversations happening in parallel and hyper hyper connected to each other 
right? That in a properly functioning network of conversations, the best ideas will, will bubble to the top and they will withstand the test of time, right? They might require some R&D to be ready for main stage. Okay, great, do the R&D. Who's in, who's interested, right? And opposing viewpoints, welcome, et cetera, et cetera. So through this free flow of ideas and with the, um, with the aim being um, saving, healing, and transforming life on earth for all, for all species and ecosystems, including humanity and all of humanity, right? Um, by making that our aim, uh, we will attract the best people, the best minds, the best hearts, the best wisdom, and we will just become this exponentially growing collective superintelligence that will solve all these problems in the maximally benevolent way versus if some um, tribe, let's say, or some sect or group or whatever tries to use this just for their own benefit, it's not that they won't be able to use the principles of collective intelligence, you know, multiple breakout rooms and hyperconnectivity and all that. Of course they will, but they will be constraining themselves with, um, you know, whatever, um, I have to change my virtual background since we're in discussion mode now. We broke into discussion mode several minutes ago, so sorry for not changing my background earlier. But we will uh, break into, um, you know, we'll be constrained by these old stories that are tribal and othering and separatist and centered around hoarding and ego and basically the dark forces, right? I think that the forces of light, of goodness, of unity of love and saving healing and transforming for all of life on earth so that life can go on that's the highest good that we can aspire to and to do this in a in a, in a context of freedom of association freedom of expression of ideas <laughs> that's unconstrained i think that will become the greatest intelligence the greatest terrestrial intelligence on earth creator anytime you want to step in and just show us how it's done go for it but till then, we've got conversation, we've got each other, and um, that that is our absolutely our best shot at uh, not just surviving, but thriving and transforming. And that is to exponentiate this collective superintelligence as quickly as possible. So, um, and that's so that's a future where there's a hierarchy of ideas of intelligence of knowledge of wisdom of benevolence of efficiency of 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 you know all these good qualities right um where the best bubble to the top there's your hierarchy right there you have a better idea don't come with guns or racism come with logic come with analysis come with some sort of proof so that we can believe you and get on board with you you know everyone has a chance does that all make sense right? A hierarchy of intelligence. And, but mashed up with, crossed with total freedom, freedom of expression, freedom of association. So we don't try to say, oh, that does not fit within this dogma or that dogma or whatever, right? right? Doesn't that sound familiar, right? No, we want it with absolute freedom of association, guaranteed. And, I, and the good thing is that it's, it's hard to find anyone in the United States who's against freedom of speech, freedom of expression, right? I see a lot of finger pointing, saying they're trying to restrict it, they're trying to restrict it, but no one's saying I'm opposed to freedom of, of expression. So it's gonna be, it's, it's an easy one to defend. And you know the basics are very simple. Um, anyway, with that, I pass the feather. I know Michael's had his hand up and uh, love to hear from everyone. Go for it, Michael. I agree with that strategy. I think Trove, our catalyst network, is going to be like people holding. Hey, Michael, you 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 muted your microphone. And uh, I believe we're well positioned for that. But I believe a great musical event can launch us into this new phase. Music can change the world, and we can do that on February twelfth and thirteenth with. Detroit's Concert for Earth. We can raise, if we sell out the tickets at $100 each, we can raise 480000 you know, less expenses. 
So that's worth doing. Uh, but we can really launch Jamin's uh, message to a bigger audience. It's going to be a global television audience where we can really, we can gain our 100,000 uh, guests to our platforms. And there's our 100th monkey, building our 100th monkey approach. So we can launch it with music. Music heals the world. Cannabis heals the world too, but I won't get, I won't go along that track. But uh, I believe we can make a big splash in February and we can change the world with one major event. And I'm working on that day and night now. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Michael. Good stuff. Yeah, there's a lot of vectors for launching this because it's going to take people coming in from lots of different communities with lots of different efforts. The key is coming together. So that's why we're doing the press conference, the block party, the open houses. And um, we're figuring out, you know, what else to schedule to really bring together, you know, hundreds, thousands of us in a network of conversations going simultaneously and hyper-connected as we keep discussing and describing. Um, that's for me is our, our single, our single great challenge right now is to do that, is to bring together first hundreds of us, then thousands, and it will just take off exponentially from there based on total freedom of expression. You know, I mean, only the obvious kinds of censorship or, you know, um, expelling or, you know, expelling people from conversations are the obvious. If someone's, you know, being hurtful, if someone's using hate or whatever. I mean, if we have a disagreement about something, let's talk about it in a constructive way. Oh, you don't like SRM? Okay, tell us why. You know, I'm not going to be, let's, let, but let's be friends and let's work it out together. Always seeking, the truth will rise to the top. How could it not, right? And we will create all the elements, all the wikis and everything else to hold discovered truth, discovered facts, discovered data that's been vetted uh, per earlier comments, right? All this will evolve with Trove and with all the different events that we do. Um, but I, my proposal to all of us is that we really put the focus on precisely building out this network of conversations and getting this collective intelligence on its exponential launch pad and off the launch pad and into space exponentiating, right? I mean, it, is it as clear to you? as it is to me, that that's the path in front of us. Again, creator, if you want to step down, alien intelligence, if you want to step down and short circuit all this and just say, look, here's the answer. Nice try, guys, but we're out of time. We're going to cool the planet this way and we're going to transform this and this and the, you know, great. But until then, it's just us, folks, <laughs> right? It's just us. So let's get together and do it. Does anyone not see what I'm seeing? Or does anyone see a better way of achieving uh, the full-scale implementation of these urgent solutions that we need to implement in order to survive and to support life on Earth generally, well beyond humanity, of course? Passing the feather. Well, I don't see any other way of doing it or achieving it anyway, I, other than, as you're saying, and also what will bubble to, to the top, not just the solution, answers to solutions and everything else, is what will bubble to the top will be that third type of uh, or that third solution as to how we can get out of out of our situation, as Umar wrote in his article. Because in 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 so doing what we're doing here and um, um, and creating a collective intelligence and gathering numbers to create a collective super intelligence, well, in so doing, we will create that third uh, ex uh, description that uh, Umar kind of shared there, a world where we can implement minimal uh, um, minimal authority but, 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 but completely driven by compassion for all life on earth you know what I mean so we have it within our grasp we have it, it, it like we have it within our, our our grasp but have we got the the will to reach out for it collectively that's that's the, that's the key question like are, is humanity and all life going to go down the drain because humanity the most intelligent species or self-claimed intelligent species couldn't really get together and, and collectively put their minds together to solve a problem. And that would be the ultimate uh, question. Will there be a history to tell it is another? So 
you know, we have only one choice and that is to get together collectively. So I, I go for uh, Umer's uh, third su suggestion and uh, definitely not one and two. <laughs> <laughs> well put, James. This is Michael. I, I would, it just struck me, if we had a logo that you could click on to connect to our conversation, like that we could share, it'd be like, okay, I'm calling it branding just for short, but if we had a logo that was a picture that summarized our campfire approach, I think we it would be easier to share, you know? I think it would be more attractive for people to click on and connect to us. Just throwing that out there. Thank you. You know, that's a really good idea. In fact, I was speculating on that earlier with re relative to the naming. What do we call this network of conversations, right? And once we have a good name for it, a good identity for it, then I think the logo will, will, will fall out from there. But I really like your idea, Michael, because imagine that it's just like in any, in myriad emails, there's just like the logo. If you click on it, boom, you're brought to the main, you know, Grand Central Station Zoom room. Hey, how can I help you? Here, Tammy's gonna take, Tammy's gonna break take you to breakout room seventeen and get you all sorted out. Well, I heard there was this really cool engineering conference going on, and I want to go to the breakout session on tribology, which starts in fifteen minutes, and I don't know where to go. Oh, great, no problem. Here, boom, there you go. Have a good one. Bye. Come back if you need more help. Simple as that, right? And we just have this thriving, growing network of conversations constituting collective super intelligence. Look, to get, I've, I've long said that if we, once we have 8,000 people, we're gonna be growing exponentially from there. Once we have 800, we're gonna grow to 8,000 very quickly, but I'm just using 800, 8,000 as these semi-arbitrary, you know, that's this magical zone where you just take off like a rocket ship once we have that critical mass. And we're almost there, let's face it. It's right in front of us, as James said, it's right in front of us for us to grasp and say, okay, let's do this now, right? Okay, <laughs> thanks. It's, it's right in front of us, right? We just have to do it. Now, what are we doing? Well, we're doing Dear Umer, you know, getting this message out to Marian community. Look, the, the fundamental thesis of our message is very simple. Together, we can create a and foster and nurture an exponentially growing collective intelligence, call it collective super intelligence, which is basically the singularity manifest. And because it's growing exponentially, it's just like we go through this utter transformation where everything will be transformed and the benevolent collective intelligence, collective super intelligence will be the hierarchy, but it'll be a hierarchy of ideas, of priorities, of this is what we need to do, including ideas and solutions for how to govern ourselves. I've seen the, the, some of the coolest, most progressive ideas in books that I've been reading lately, one of which Jim McGreen mentioned earlier today, the Ministry of the Future or Ministry for the Future, whatever it's called. Anyway, great book, but it's got such great solutions for redistribution of wealth and Pro, any ultra progressive taxation forms that basically just don't allow people to just pile up wealth if they're not doing something very meaningful with it. And um, anyway, it, it's just brilliant stuff. So the solutions are out there. We just need the collective intelligence. Thank you, Michael. We need the collective super intelligence, right? Anyway, with that, I pass the talking feather. I think you're, We've been working towards this time and we're pretty close to being ready. You've been strategizing this for uh, quite a while, Jamin. I think it's going to be bearing fruit very soon. I'm very positive about our progress. And Vincent's, uh, Vincent's uh, report today was excellent. Look at all we can do with, tr with Catalyst.network. Amazing, man. So that's going to be, that's going to be just, uh, I don't know. It's going to put Facebook to shame. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, I mean, just having all these hundreds and then thousands and then tens of thousands of conversations going in parallel, figuring out every last detail that needs to be figured out in the realm of the solutions that we need to co-create and implement, some with tremendous urgency, 
right? Like the marine cloud brightening. We have no more time to screw around. We've got to get that going. For that reason, that, that's reason alone to put all our efforts behind collective superintelligence evolving. And no more, no more, man. Thank you, John. No more, man. No more of that. No more lonely times for people. That's it. That's it. If I may, there, Jamin, I'd like to just share the two minutes of Rupert Reed, what he says about uh, collectively and intelligent, intelligently getting together. Oh, it's absolutely, just... James. Yeah, pl please go for it. Please go for it. Okay. Look at the way that so many people in the US or UK still kind of think, oh, we're invulnerable, we're rich, we'll engineer our way out of this. Well, I bet that that's what a lot of people in California were thinking until recently. And no, I can and tell they you a lot, are, of they, thinking, yeah. a lot of them are not thinking that anymore. And the and same in Germany, you know, you look at the recent floods in Germany, um, so many people killed, such a vast area inundated and swept away. And, you know, Germany is about the best prepared country in the world in terms of flood defenses. I mean, it's way better than most of the US and the UK. If it can happen in Germany, it can happen anywhere where there is water and, and there is gonna be water kind of everywhere soon, except when there is nowhere. out in desert. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, this kind of pride, it comes before a fall, you know? And that's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm not super optimistic about our chances of, of getting through this. And when I say our chances, I mean, including in the in the rich countries where we're sitting right now, I think it's really interesting to, to think of the coronavirus pandemic as an analogy uh, yeah. here. Yeah. Where are the places that have done the, the best on coronavirus? Well, they're um, Taiwan, uh, New Zealand, um, Sierra Leone. Um, right. and where are the places that have done the worst? Well, they're the US, uh, the UK and Brazil. Um, i.e. countries that have been run by uh, by crazy uh, populists, but two of the three countries are very uh, wealthy countries, obviously on a on a worldwide scale. We we've seen in the coronavirus pandemic that we are not invulnerable to entering into a chaotic situation where we have unusually high um, uh, death rates. Well, you know why is why should this why assume it's going to be different on the on the climate front so again i say what i said before yeah sure you know we need to be helping right now people who are in terrible shape in uh, bangladesh in low-lying island states in parts of africa but we also need to be not making the rash assumption that well we're going to be okay uh, no we, we are potentially highly vulnerable as well and we need to be changing our systems and we need to be wising up to the fact that we are not going to engineer our way out of this. We are not going to survive between behind ever higher walls if that's all that we try to, to do. They will be fragile. The only way we get through this is by transforming our systems in a way that works with nature, not against nature, uh, and that works uh, collectively and intelligently in the kind of way, for example, that the, uh, the UK and the US populations did during the Second World War. Awesome stuff. Very well said. You see, that's totally consistent with the network of conversations, collectively and intelligently. We're intentionally amping up our intelligence so that we can come up with all the interconnected, interlocking, interdependent solutions to get us from this very precarious moment we're in right now to a much safer place. Right. Let's yeah, break. I've been pitching the idea that uh, Detroit helped to save the uh, the nation in World War Two, and Detroit is going to help build solar radiation mirrors to save the Earth now again. And uh, it's up to us. That's why I'm having the uh, the concert here. We're going to build those uh, Dr. Tower designed uh, SRMs, and I'm selling the idea of starting manufacturing right away after we raise the money from the concert just uh, shifting right into production. It's my dream. Thank you. Cool. Well, now is our time to come together in conversation and dream together. 
and together dream into a new future, a new story for humanity and a strategy on how to get there that will constantly be evolving and updating the plan, informing the planning process, which is constantly evolving, All right? But we've got to take the very first step, which is to build the collective intelligence that will evolve quickly and exponentially through the stages of collective super intelligence. And once we get there, we'll have a much greater appreciation for intelligence period. And we'll be able to map out even our future evolution from there forward. But I mean, it's gonna be going exponentially. So it's like the singularity is basically at our doorstep, it's knocking. And we're like, the door, the door is a little bit rusty and squeaky. So we're kind of pulling on it a little bit, right? But we're getting there. We're definitely getting there. And don't judge us by our numbers. To paraphrase Yoda, judge me by my size, do you? <laughs> right? No, you don't measure us by our numbers. You measure us by the Jack and the Beanstalk DNA, which is just now germinating and about to explode. Right? And we get to be there ushering it through the birth of the new golden age powered by collective super intelligence. I mean, what could be more cool? That's the future. It's singular. It's singular. We can keep, we, we, you know, <clears throat> the mayor has mapped out three different, you know, possible futures. They're really categories of futures, each of which containing infinite variations within those categories, but there's a lot more categories. The one category I'm talking about, well, that actually fits within Umer's third scenario, which is you achieve a balance between progress and hierarchy. But the ideal hierarchy is a hierarchy of, of truth, of knowledge, right? Of solutions, of ideas, right? Of actions, of priorities, of plans, of strategies. But we're the best bubble to the top. And it's not at all based on legacy or who's who or who's whoever's son or daughter or heir or heiress or whatever, right? Or, or worse yet, hierarchies based on race or religion or philosophy, allegiance to Trump or whatever you have, right? Whatever flavor of totalitarianism or fascism. No, this is, this is the most benevolent hierarchy of all because it removes from humanity the ring of power, the Bilbo Baggins, you know, Frodo Baggins ring of power, right? In Lord of the Rings. That's not good for humans. We need to get rid of it. This is the way to get rid of it. With pure objective truth and pure benevolence looking out for the good of the whole. That's it. Passing the talking feather. Yeah, it strikes me. I wonder, did, did Vincent have, a, have an issue with his laptop computer today? Because I thought we might, and I'm throwing this out there. I'm marketing this idea a little bit. If we could uh, enlist a good computer company to back us with our growth right away and build that build that bridge right away and let them know we're going to need computers for our efforts and what can you do for us you know i don't think i wonder i want to throw that i want to sow that seed for building uh like a pitch a pitch document that we could forward to some good computer companies that we trust thank you yeah yeah not just computers but software and consulting you know participation you know jump in with us get into it you know, I'd say even more than asking them for funding or support like that is join us in the conversation, learn what this is about and learn how you can reinvent yourselves. Just like we were talking earlier about this pharmaceutical chain and insurance, health insurance company, a huge, gigantic one, um, you know, and possible scenarios for working with them uh, for food healers, et cetera. So the possibilities are endless. It's a matter of ramping up our collective intelligence into collective superintelligence. I mean, I'm just going to keep saying it until it freaking happens, <laughs> right? And that's why we're inviting all of you, uh, Umer, and all your wonderful, amazing uh, readers, right, as a, as a community to join the network of conversations, to join the press conference, to join uh, this evolving collective superintelligence. Likewise, Guy McPherson's community, Professor Steven Salter's community, Dr. Yeetao's community, right? XR, as we were talking with earlier, 
right? And on and on and on. It's about bringing all of us together without any human hierarchy. Hey, I'm the founder, I'm the owner, I'm the Mark Zuckerberg of this. You all have to pay me to be here or, or let me put ads in front of you that make you want to commit suicide. Right. No, it's just about the truth. There's no money component. There's no human hierarchy. There's just the hierarchy of ideas and everything is so free flowing. Until we've experienced it, we're just talking about sending people to the moon in a rocket ship. What I'm saying is let's get in the rocket ship and light the dang fuse and get the heck out of town with this. Seriously. So anyway, that's what my focus is mainly these days so that we precisely direct it towards this future, which is like this evolving mathematical optimum, right? That's the idea is to optimize, save as much life on earth as possible, right? And heal as much life on earth as possible and make it possible for us for life to go on, not to get extinguished in a crash and burn horrific you know, tragic ending. No, we've got to do this. We've got to build the distributed collective intelligence evolving towards collective super intelligence and beyond from there, of course, because there is no end to it. It'll just keep growing exponentially. So, and the thing is, <clears throat> um, I think that's inevitable at this point. The only question is, are we able to do it in a way that pulls in it, that invites in as many people as possible, as quickly as possible, so that we just it just goes worldwide, grows exponentially, and just becomes the thing? Or are we going to have different kind of tribes, different nations doing each their own form of collective intelligence and evolving on parallel but separate tracks, right? Um, because you know the same principles of collective intelligence apply also to to tribes that want to use them or political parties or even totalitarian you know regimes you know the 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 nazi regime in germany during world war ii they used forms of collective intelligence certainly they had meetings they met, they had plans they had scrutiny analysis and lots of people participating in a network of conversations. So they had collective intelligence for very evil purposes. In the end, they weren't very efficient and they were conquered, rightly so. Um, but the, the point is very simply that collective intelligence can be used at any level. And I think it's up to us to figure out a pathway to get this going so that it just grows so quickly as the benevolent form of collective intelligence that we just leave in the dust any thoughts of having, you know, tribal or in in any other ways um these negative hierarchies and hierarchies of dominance and oppression exploitation etc um that we just like so far outrun those that we and and we and the collective intelligence figures out ways to extinguish those movements that are harmful right and they shouldn't be too hard to distinguish those from others that are just kind of out there creative, right? Because there's a fine line between. And so we always have to strike that balance between freedom of expression and, you know, um, saving life on earth, right? Hierarchy and progress. Anyway, I, I feel like I'm kind of reaching the end of my rope in terms of what I have to say about that. Now we do have comments to read, but anyway, I'm gonna get rid of the, I'm gonna pa gently pass on the talking feather. <laughs> Love to hear from you all. Thanks. Well, we have a hierarchy of problems. The world globally, uh, you know, collectively, we have a, a hierarchy of problems. And at the top, uh, you know, the topmost being uh, planetary overheating, exponential overheating. So we also have a clock ticking, according even to the IPCC and their, um, you know, mild version of it. But we, nonetheless, we have a clock ticking. We have a hierarchy of problems, starting with the most uh, urgent extra exponential overheating, and the clock ticking. So some people may argue we have plenty, we have more time to do this, or we have more time to that to do that. At the end of the day, the argument against time or anything else is exponential overheating. So regardless of how you look at it, we need to get these uh, situations implement, you know, in motion within the next twelve months. No matter how long, how, how you look at it, 
it needs to be things need to start getting moving and within 12 months and the only way we're going to do it is collectively is together is collectively together simple as that so we have as a human species or as the human species as the shepherds of this planet uh, and all life that's on it we have a choice in front of us now do we collectively get together to solve our problems and try to you know pers uh, persist a little longer uh, in our uh, short span of life uh, you know on this planet but at least persist for another few millennia um without destroying ourselves or just prove that we're just incapable of getting together to save our own asses simple and plain passing the feather beautiful james beautiful thank you And you see that question that you just posed to us and to the world, James, since we're recording, um, is a perfect question for Umera's readership. Can we get together and do this? And who better to put out the clarion call than Umer himself? Umer, you put out the call, people will show up. And we exponentiate from there. That's when the rocket ship leaves the gantry. When we have that first meeting where several hundred of us show up committed to doing this. Right, passing the feather. Go ahead, Marco. Yeah, I, I mean, even even you know, the, in the last few months, you know, more and more governments and like the IPCC report are are at least admitting the problem is bad, and if we go based on uh, uh, what did the IPCC say? Basically, we have 10 years, uh, and, and I'm not quite sure if they said 10 years to start doing, taking action, or, to, or 10 years to formulate a plan. Either, either way, uh, let's, say we, let's say we agree and there, we have 10 years. Are we gonna wait till uh nine and three quarter years to start doing something about it why why with the price tag you know being so big the 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 end of our life on earth why would we why would we not be doing everything as fast as we can and another point to look at uh you know well let me back up a little bit you know why would we not do this as quickly as we can you you wouldn't you wouldn't wait until uh uh a few minutes before uh a flood if you knew it was coming you wouldn't wait until 10 minutes before to start packing you you do it the, as quickly as you could you wouldn't uh, buy a fire extinguisher when the fire is starting right right when the fire starts you're not going out to shop for fire extinguishers yeah thank you uh, uh, that's that's a really good good example michael thank you uh but then also factor in the fact that we can see from all the previous reports and all the previous things people have seen that we've they they've missed the timeline how many times like every time so we uh, you know we shouldn't have any faith in in their timeline we should be doing everything we can do and doing it now uh, you know, absent a time machine to go back and do it when we should have done it in order for things not to be as bad as they are now. Uh, I hope, I hope I'm, I made s some sense there. And with that, I passed the feather. Yeah, you did. Totally. No, it's, it's very clear. And the first step is coming together. That's how we really build a powerful planetary movement to solve all of our problems together. We need to come together. And the first step is in conversation, first phase in conversation. Anyone can call it blah, 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 but it's, it is the first stage of evolution of us as a species coming together and co-creating solutions, implementing those 
some publicly, some quietly, as, as we talked about earlier. We speculated earlier that maybe the best way to get SRM done is to do the marine cloud brightening quietly. Don't even apply for permits. Just send them out there and start spraying water into the air. Is, is that a crime to spray salt water into the air in the middle of the Pacific? I mean, come on. It's, it's, of course, it's not a crime, right? I mean, people are spewing all kinds of greenhouse gases and soot and chemical waste every time they go to the grocery store, right? You don't need a permit for that. Why should there be a permit for spraying water into the air to cool the planet down a bit? I mean, it's absurd that anyone would object to it. But nonetheless, why not just do it quietly without any fanfare? Once we have the funding, we just do it, right? It's, it's a possibility, right? Anyway, the point is, let's bring our collective intelligence together so that we can map out the best strategy forward, quietly, publicly, some kind of hybrid. Let's figure it out. That's just one dimension of it. There's myriad dimensions. What mix of solutions? Each solution is its own dimension. How much of this? How much of that? Right? We've got to figure it all out together with the other mega solutions that we need to save, heal, and transform life on Earth. Everyone going to a plant based diet. Food is a base, plant based food, nutritious plant based food is a basic human right. Um, transforming our political system, transforming our currency system, our economies, everything from taxation to laws, everything. It's time for a general upgrade, right? And a growing up, a maturing of humanity into the caretaker species. And one of the first things, the, the first thing we need to do as caretaker species is cool the planet and feed everyone and stop killing animals and, 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 and. It's so obvious that's where we're going to gravitate towards because when you go for maximum benevolence and the best ideas bubble to the top, that's where you go. It's, it's the law of the singularity in the 22 immutable laws of marketing, which I cite frequently. It's the law, there, there's a singular path here and it's towards the optimum of saving as much life on earth as possible, healing as much life on earth and setting us on a transformed pathway into the future to protect and heal and enrich life on earth, the full diversity of it. It's as simple as that. That leads to a singular path forward, cooling the planet, feeding everyone, caring for everyone, caring for all ecosystems and species, transforming our story, transforming our culture, transforming our game from this omnicidal game of hoarding to a game of healing and sharing and caring and love and unity, togetherness, not this separation that goes hand in hand with capitalism and hoarding and private property and fences and barbed wire fences and guns and tribes. The all, and, I mean, day, it's just... the all day monopoly game. Yeah. And they're building a big Amazon fulfillment center near where I produce my events. And uh, it's going to be full of things, four stories full of things. Used to be a a big uh, state fairgrounds where people could congregate. Now it's just a bunch of things. It's going to be uh, opening in the probably uh, in the spring. I don't know. Anyway, thank you. What, what's, what's the location, Michael? Detroit uh, State Fairgrounds. Seriously? Wow. Yeah, they took that over. Remember those beautiful grounds? It's all uh, Amazon. Half of that's Amazon. They're, they're leasing the, the building from the building owner. Amazon's leasing it, and they're going to fill it with things, man. So, you know, that's uh, what Jamin said. Totally, it supports what he said. There, these the fulfillment centers are going around the country, man. <laughs> so we got to get some of that, some of his uh, his uh, funding. We will secure some of his funding. Assure, I will assure you. Thank you. Yeah, Jamin, you're frozen on my screen. I'm not sure. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? You now, I hear, now, I, now I hear you. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah, I'm really worried about these. Amazon is is now making, uh, they're, they're around these fulfillment centers. They're, they're trying to do whole towns and make them company towns. 
company cities where it's going to be just like the old coal days, you know, I owe my soul to the company store. I think we're, we're, we're getting a little off topic here because we're on. Yeah, that's on true. Picture. We could, we could criticize American corporations for millennia to come, but. Um, yeah. I so, think we should, uh, pardon me, James. No, I was just saying, I think you're right. I think we should, um, we should maybe read one or two of the comments as well. From the Great idea. Great idea. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thanks for reining me back in. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Murray, Marco, we all know you're a wild horse. All right. Comments. Oh, I've got um, sort of weak signal here, so it may take me a minute to pull it up on my phone. If somebody wants to get the jump on it, go for it. Otherwise, just bear with me, please. I'm sure it'll come up. Okay, Nick Gomez writes, Upton Sinclair's The Jungle should be required middle school reading in the U.S. That's where we're headed. We might have been able to stop it in the late 90s if Gore had become president, but it's too late now. There's too much momentum going the other way. FDR, Truman, and Eisenhower, Eisenhower needed a decade-long economic depression and a world war to get the consensus necessary to set up most of our contemporary social safety net and infrastructure in the US. Lyndon B. Johnson was an outlier, a country that can spend $2 trillion over 20 years on a large pile of rocks, Afghanistan, without much to show for it, but won't spend three and a half trillion on its own citizens does not really have much of a chance as a country it's way bigger than any one person. In a few years, I'm selling everything, buying a yacht and mounting Starlink satellite internet on it. I'll be able to work from anywhere for anyone I want to. After that, adios. <laughs> anyway, that's Nick's comment. I'm just gonna read a few comments here and just feel free to jump in whenever you have a comment on any of these comments. Um, bon voyage, bon voyage, Nick. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah, my comment is goodness, you know, look, either we're giving up or we're staying in the mission of saving, healing and transforming life on earth. Take your pick and then, you know, God help you. <laughs> right. I mean, Apollo 13, well, let's get the duct tape and the plastic out and let's start taping things up. Apollo 13, remember? What, wasn't that's it right. Apollo 13? That's what, that's right, that's right. Yeah, and we've okay, delved into that here you. quite a bit. Yeah. Next one, Ephraim Mower says, I appreciate the Scorpions reference near the beginning. Um, I guess it's Winds of Change or something like that. Now, next one by Joseph Lambert. Which society, uh, quoting Umer, which society is an example of that kind of future? America is. Their old hierarchies are beginning to implode, but society cannot agree on new ones. Without consent, the result is and da, 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 da. And uh, Joseph writes, there are more examples, including the entire European Union and particularly Hungary and Poland. Merkel was the Arctic architect of austerity measures across Europe and her surrogates used these measures to increase the population's poverty as a result of a debt crisis which hit the area at the time of the 2008 financial crisis. A new institutional vacuum is now forming in more European countries, and this is expected to continue until the midway point of this decade. Afterwards, fascist parties will start controlling more than half the union, and the austerity measures that were imposed by the union will continue in a harsher manner eventually leading to more debt defaults as climate calamity hits a greater hits at a greater speed. I mean, you know, 
that basically the way I see it, we're either, you know, predicting and waiting for calamitous, disastrous outcomes, or we're working hard towards positive outcomes, right? So, you know, I'm really not interested in predictions of, of negative outcomes. I'm, I'm interested in collective super intelligence transforming and getting us onto a radically new trajectory towards progress, towards saving, healing, and transforming life on earth. Jump in anytime with any comments. We're in open comment, <laughs> let it flow session. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, excuse me. <clears throat> Mark writes, it seems America has, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry, I wondered where are those comments coming from? Yeah, from the so story from the article that we read earlier. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. He posts his article. People post comments. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So Mark writes: It seems America has been in and out for moments only of the predatory system. I think back to prohibition and mafia societies. The Wild West was called that for a reason. Predation. We live today with indigenous people who still suffer the intergenerational trauma from a multitude of massacres and we can't even feel it we ignore them as they sit beside us in their squalid poverty the trauma the damage is visible thrown at us and we do nothing we do not deserve salvation umer and we will not get it it is for people like you umer and me who have insight into the human condition we are the ones who suffer, suffer, suffer to live with this until the joyous day that we stop having consciousness. My goodness. My daughter and her two little ones are indigenous. Noongar, Perth, Western Australia. I identify with them. My heart breaks every day. I have terrible fear and anxiety as I watch my grandkids, uh, Shailila and Curtis, come into consciousness and realize who they are and where they are placed in the world as they absorb the world and be and understand the horrors of existence to be a human being truly being is not worth it but i cannot leave them i must try to protect and guide them but i fear that we are being overwhelmed my goodness powerful stuff well that's 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 just a typical example of uh one just one typical example of distress that majority of people or parents are under no to this day like and it's just a another example of one of Omer's previous articles about you know living with the stress and and the collapse around around this living with the stress of it and everything else um yeah, I mean, I, I'm here all the. I, I'm here as much time as I can be, but not for my because I worry about myself, but because I worry for my daughter and others, basically. And um, that's what we need to be thinking about. We have to be thinking not about ourselves, but about others and all life, because that's what's at at, at stake. Passing the better. Well put, James. Wow, from a parental perspective well put yeah beautiful james thank you laura davis writes i think we are coming to our own intervention whether we like it or not we will face ourselves and choose i ask you to imagine a world where the economy is not measured by substance or quantity but by the beauty and love it took to hold together. I keep coming up with honey as a measure of health and well being. In the playground of my mind, I can see a religion based on the holy honey. What do we consider sacred? How would you teach sensitivity to creation? I still marvel at our capacities. If only we thought everyone marvelous, the real undiscovered wealth is our own creativity. We need a vision of our potential more exciting than COVID and collapse is dreadful. Amen to that. On a more personal note, consider nurturing your inner comic. You have a wealth of history to draw upon. There's nothing more healing than learning to laugh at our pain and the folly of our foolishness. With that, everyone can relate. 
I am not oblivious to the reality of suffering, injury, and injustice. We are all accountable, and we will sink or swim together. There is no island of safety while our brothers drown. Wow. I would say that there are no islands of safety, period, no, regardless, because that's that sounds like that comment is coming from a person from, you know, like ourselves from the, the Western world and, and the privileged world and thinking that climate change is only going to be affecting those people out in the Pacific Islands and things like that in Africa and the poor countries. No, it's not. It's going to be affecting every country, every island, everybody. So we got to start feeling sorry for our children and our, our and God willing future generations. We got to, you know, get rid of this selfishness about ourselves. Simple and plain. Yeah, totally, James. Thank you. Um, yeah, for me, as I think about you know, what's going on in the world, and I face it, and that's a very painful thing to do. Um, what gives me hope is precisely that island of collective super intelligence that we're in the process of building, because that will launch us into whole new realms, whole new story, whole new culture, whole new civilization whole new relationship with Mother Earth, reverence for Mother Earth, reverence for each other and our well-being, a true, genuine caring for each other, just a radical transformation that the collective superintelligence will be able to design and orchestrate and implement, period, right? You need to win a national ele election? Great. Who's got the, the most, who objectively has the best truth, the best strategy, the best plan, all totally transparent for the benefit of all. You do, great, bubbles to the top, great. The whole collective intelligence supports that candidate, that party winning the election, right? It can be used as, a, I mean, how will, it, how will it not achieve that? Of course it's gonna achieve that, being collective super intelligence. So right now I say, I, I, all eyes on collective superintelligence. Let's get this thing exponentiated. And once it goes, it will take it from there. <laughs> we can kick back a little bit, seriously, because so many wonderful people will be participating, right? And this is a medium which attracts wonderful people. Just look around the room, right? They may not have shaved for a while, but they are wonderful people. Who has time to shave when you're saving, healing, and transforming life? That's Earth? it. That's it. I was wearing a mask at a well-known person's concert, and the guy asked me what I was doing there. I said, uh, I'm, I'm David Letterman. I had my mask on. He laughed. All right. So um, I say we take a pause. All right. After a brief pause, next comments. Mark Kavanaugh writes, every classroom needs a banner that says everything, everything comes from our planet. Instead of a pledge of allegiance to a flag, there should be a pledge of allegiance to a partnership with our planet. How cool is that? Chris Wilson writes, define the future you want to live into first and then decide on the kind of knowledge, tools, skills, practices, and institutions you need to get there. I'm gonna reread that again because he's basically saying what I'm saying, but in slightly different words. Define the future you want to live into first and then decide on the kind of knowledge tools, skills, practices, and institutions you need to get there, okay? With our collective intelligence, we can together define that future that we want to live into, and then we can define the strategy and plan for getting there. Is it possible to get there? If so, how? What do we need to do? 
how do we take care of everyone and all of our brother and sister species and ecosystems and life supporting systems it's going to take a collective intelligence to put Humpty Dumpty back together again well manos a la obra hands to the job let's do this okay that's just the beginning of a, of a medium length post again from the beginning define the future you want to live into first and then decide on the kind of knowledge tools skills practices and institutions you need to get there choosing among these three options won't get you or us anywhere except a resurrection of some ghost from the past oh my goodness i think he's referring to the three options umer listed hierarchy leads to someone in charge although here, I've got to jump in and comment here where Chris is saying hierarchy leads to someone in charge. No, the hierarchy we're proposing with collective superintelligence is a hierarchy of ideas, of knowledge, of truth, right? And constantly updated and revised and improved upon by the collective. Um, very kind of Wikipedia style, I must say, right? Um, but anyway, hierarchy leads to someone in charge which again, I'm challenging, which leads to, I have all the answers, which leads to the exclusion of many voices, which leads to a collapse of collective intelligence and the targeting of subhuman groups. Hierarchy is in large measure how we got to where we are today, both positively and negatively. But hierarchy has outgrown its usefulness in a world poised on becoming a global complex life form whose knowledge doubles every 90 days. My goodness. <laughs> As a governing principle, I prefer democracy, rule by the people, not that they are governed by some person or group. True democracy invites shared ownership, shared responsibility, shared learning, shared decision making, and shared accountability. Hierarchy just shuts all that down. And so it is antithetical to the needs of our time. But what kind of democracy? What should its rules and practices be? I guess that depends on the kind of future we want. Again, it's the critical question. What kind of future do we want? Do we want a future where we all survive and thrive? Or a future where this God-given Christian Republican right to own and hoard and conquer and own and hoard as much as I want is preserved for a few, what, sociopaths? Uh, eh, are you kidding? No. Anyway, we need to define it. Let's have the conversation. Let's, but let's have it within the context of a network of conversations where you've got conversations about where we want to get to, conversations on how to get there, conversations centered around specific problems like exponential planetary overheating and its solutions. You know, just imagine the whole taxonomy of topics, but all together now so that each one can inform and support the others. So in terms of wh what kind of future do we want? There's a lot of facets to that question. Well, let's have conversations on each of the facets. You with me? What do we want in terms of diet? What do we want in terms of living arrangements, working arrangements, industries? You know, do we want to be agrarian and very manual and kind of get back to basics? Or do we want to be hypo techno geek Jetsons flying around? I mean, <laughs> I think we can convert, if I may, uh, convert some of our pasture land to cannabis growing. And we can heal and transform and save the earth with cannabis in part. Thank you. Yeah, great example, great example. But without some, and, and Chris continues, but without some semblance of a shared answer to that question, we are guaranteed to regress because our governance systems were not designed for this modern world. And if we cannot evolve them, they will choke us back into an old world, right? I love a lot of the things Chris is saying here. Bottom line, we need to choose what kind of future do we want to live into and then how do we make that happen right collective intelligence can answer all those questions way better than any one of us and so anyway again i, I i'm just kind of in dreaming into this hierarchy of truth hierarchy of solutions hierarchy of workability hierarchy of you know reality truth including the truth of what we can and must do 
to save, heal, and transform life on Earth, including marine cloud brightening. <laughs> That's going to be like the first thing out of the nest, right? As this collective intelligence picks up speed, it's going to be just obvious. That's going to bubble to the top in parallel with feeding everyone plant-based foods and on and on and on and on. Let's get the basics right. Cool the place down, feed everyone, stop the killing machine and et cetera, et cetera. It's so clear. It's so clear. You know, yeah, exactly. it is. It is exactly that clear. It's, it's not a question of what do we want. It's, we not need to start asking ourselves what do we need. And if the only way we can figure that out is by making a priority list of what our problems are, and collectively using our collective intelligence to then solve those uh, that list of problems in priority. And we'll soon see that the, as I said, the war, global warming is our main priority. So. Solar radiation management management will flourish to the or bubble to the top there, but the point is, we will. It's not a, we shouldn't ask us as what we want. We should be asking us as what do we need to, to to continue. And as we figure out what we need to continue to solve the problems that so we can continue, we will then figure out what it is we are becoming, what 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 world we want, what world we will have, because we start to solve the problems. But unless we do that. Then you know we don't have a world. We we're going to go down into the scenario number two, as Umar described, Mad Max scenario. So we need to ask ourselves, what do we need, and what are our problems? Yeah, and it's very clear. We need to eat. We need community. We need meaning. We need a story that unites us. I think the perfect story at this stage is saving, healing, and transforming life on Earth. That is the story, right? Yeah, that's the game. You know, yeah. and, you know, um, Umer or one of the commenters wrote about World War II and how we cooperated during World War II, or maybe that was from a previous um, writer. Doesn't matter. Um, no, it, yeah, this, that was from the previous uh, Facing Future episode. Um, but the bottom line is that. Um, we know how to do this as a species. We know how to cooperate. We know how to come together for the common good. Now we have this extraordinary tool set in front of us to help us do this in a much more efficient and explosive way, in a good way, <laughs> right? Explosive growth, which we need right now. We need for collective superintelligence to evolve and evolve onto parity and then superiority to the problems that we're facing. Parity when we can finally grapple with it. Superiority when it collective intelligence keeps hyper exponentiating, <laughs> and it, as it does so, it continues to look down on problems that become increasingly trivial to solve. The truth is, marine cloud brightening is a trivial solution. Its its cost is essentially zero. <laughs> it won't involve any ongoing burning of fossil fuels or anything like that. It's totally natural, totally simple, totally clean non-burning i mean how can you say no to that and it's absolutely essential to save life on earth anyway um collective intelligence will get us there cha-ching and feeding everyone and eliminating um, animal agriculture etc cetera, etc cetera. we'll figure out all the above as well as political transformation a new story we're, we're talking about an intelligence that we can barely imagine just because we've never seen anything like it before it's like way beyond. It's like taking our taking humanity and kind of fusing us together into a super organism. That's what this amounts to with a super brain, a collective super intelligence. And I'm telling you, come, cross that with benevolence, right? And integrity and transparency, et cetera. Because, you know, uh, what, what are some of the, the expressions? Everything that rises must converge. The light seeks other light and et cetera, et cetera. We, we, we're yearning to come together. We just need to take this final step and actually come together as a network of conversations and manifest collective intelligence, come collective superintelligence and exponentiate from there. All right, jump in anytime. James, did you want to? Okay, go ahead. Well, I was, uh, all, and all it takes literally it, it's not going to cost anything as such. All it'll take is for each of us to step into it from time to time, to give it a bit of time, to commit to it for a little bit of your time in your week and join conversations that 
or of interest to you that's not very hard to ask it's actually something that you will find beneficial to yourself stress relieving to find people like-minded people and everything else but collectively all those conversations are going to bring solutions to the for to the you know to the surface and and design and create this new world that we're talking about and help you know save heal and transform the, the world we're in at the moment so that's all it takes really we just need to step into it and give it a little time each week whatever each day whatever you want to put into it it's up to you but be part of it because that's what it's called that's the key collective beautiful beautiful i mean it's just so clear right there's collective intelligence and then there's everything else right Dave Thaler writes, everywhere we look and reside on this planet, we witness cooperation. Trees produce oxygen, humans produce CO2. Without this symbiotic relationship, neither would exist. It is a natural law. Cooperate or die. It's set up that way. We cooperate, we cooperate or we die. It's that basic yet apparently intellectually impossible to comprehend that it applies not only to the world around you, but also toward each other. And then Chris Wilson, who we heard from earlier, writes, what kind of world do we want? And he responds, this is the question we all should be asking ourselves. And then asking it again and again with family, friends, neighbors, people not like us even what is the future we want to live into if we can get some idea about a shared future then we can work together with the knowledge tools skills practices and institutions we need to get us there problem is nobody generally especially leaders is asking this question so there is little little opportunity to discover the commonalities we all share we are, what we are left with are the ventings of our fears and frustrations, which leaders try to capitalize on in their quest for power. We cannot change the past. We can barely influence the present, but the future is ours to choose. And don't be too surprised if what we choose as most important to us is the same for almost everyone. I love this. I love it. Good stuff. Yeah, and um, in in you know in regards to that, we can choose to not. I mean, I, everybody that gets involved in these conversations and all the comments in the Umara section, they all we all agree on one thing: that our world leaders are not doing the job they're supposed to be doing. You know what I mean? If anything, they're fucking it all up. Sorry for the language, but the point is, we can all agree on that. But we don't have to continue to depend on them. What we're offering here, basically, is for us to you know, self-govern ourselves, to co collectively crew up with solutions and, imp and and implement them without even fucking bothering or concerning the government about with the majority of it anyway, unless it's absolutely necessary in certain, certain circumstances. But the point is, what I'm saying is, we just need to act ourselves because if we're waiting on our world leaders to do it, then, you know, we're just waiting on Mad Max world. That's all I'm saying. Simple as that. And I know I'm after referring to that and referencing that a couple of times now tonight. But I'm I'm doing it purposely because that you know people need to hear the truth at the end of the day. And yeah, I'm not saying it's going to be a Mad Max scenario. I'm not saying that you know. I'm just saying that these are possibilities. Omar put it out in front of us there with three scenarios, and those are basically three scenarios. If I was like we're living the first one anyway, in the hierarchical one anyway. But I don't want to go into the second one, and I, I, I see the third one as our only way out collectively. So, um, yeah, just step into it. Beautiful. Thank you, James. Thanks for jumping in and keep jumping in, my friends. Ron Gringo writes, the recent collapses of everything seems seem to suggest hierarchy is here to stay. The coming years will all be about making do with less 
as the Malthusian pressures of a still growing world population wrecks the idea that particular lives matter if headcount and productivity are doomed to permanent disconnection. Wow. Deborah Crank Lewis writes, the waves of Schumpeter's wave may be growing shorter until they grow longer. That's a little beyond my pay grade. Feel free to jump in. Um, Can you repeat that one again, please? Sure. The waves of Schumpeter's wave may be growing shorter until they grow longer. I think someone would have to volunteer to look up Schumpeter's wave. Um, next, A1SW developer writes, we need to fix the world. Maybe what we need is to fix, to fix as humans. What kind of world do we want? What is that hierarchy and where did it come from? What is progress? Why do we need progress? <laughs> what is the alternative? What happens if the hierarchy comes undone? What is worse, super predators or zillions of regular old human predators? What do you want? Hierarchy. Groups vying to pull each other down or one where consensual hierarchy has collapsed into predation or one which improbably hierarchy and progress have learned improbably to walk hand in hand. Um, this is a long, I don't know, the, this is super long and no claps, <laughs> just so you know, he just kind of goes on and on. Linda Scanlon writes, the last option about which you write is adorable, but not attainable. And you know it, Lynn. Wow. My goodness. Nikos writes in response to better to be in the middle of prospering hierarchies than writing precariously atop collapsing ones. Nikos writes in response, it's better to serve in heaven than reign in hell. Even if you are on top, sooner or later, hell will get you. And who in their right mind would choose to live in hell anyway? This is brilliant. My goodness. Yehuda writes, without constitutional basic rights, any bad thing is possible and will happen. <laughs> That's a good point. Sender Spike writes in response to can we have both those things? Is that asking too much? No, yes. Look into history. Social hierarchies and value-based economics always end the same. It's true for their whole time of their existence. And then he writes a link to an article he wrote or a couple articles. Anyway, so that's it with the comments. Um, you know, it's, it's just, this is a fascinating exploration about basically, are we willing to take on the challenge of redesigning our futures, choosing and redesigning and designing a pathway to a future that we, to James's point, not that so much that we want, but that we need. And it's obvious what we need, what the world needs. It's obvious. So let's get together and map it out and implement it including but not limited to marine cloud brightening and feeding everyone, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the basics. And then we go from there. Dear Umer, passing the feather. All right. Well, if there are many any more comments, please feel free to jump oh, in. Otherwise, an example example of rattling the cages a little bit. My cousin is a pediatrician out in Indiana, where they have like ten thousand Afghanistani citizens, like folks from there, and she's helping them. But the federal government hasn't come through with the supplies and the medical supplies, and it's like so I. I'm getting the information. I'm going to report it to my representative. They're waiting on my information so they can follow up at the federal government level. And, uh, you know, let's get some supplies to these folks. Come on, man. Yeah, I don't know if it's buried in the new uh, in the new bill that everybody's haggling over, you know, trying to build consensus, consensus but there's information, there's, there's plot. Yeah, 
my goodness, so many problems that need to be solved holistically and simultaneously. Hence the urgent need for collective superintelligence. We can do this. Any other comments? Feel free to jump in. All right, let's take a pause. All right, well, this has been very enlightening. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, Umer, for your amazing articles. Thank you for your wonderful readership and our wonderful community, all of us coming together. Let us continue to do so. We will see you on the next Dear Umer, which we're about to record right away. So we'll see you there. Thanks, everyone.